All right, KISS Army, welcome to the KISS FAQ Podcast. Thank you for giving us your time today and letting us into your head. I hope we don't do any damage. This is a KISS-related podcast by the board for the board. We hope that you enjoy. All right, welcome to episode 445 of the KISS FAQ Podcast. I'm your host, Julian Gill. Today I'm joined by Marcus Almighty Mark. Greetings. 69th Blizzard Ken. Hey there. And everyone else is busy at work or living their lives. How about that? So before we get into this week's episode, no one else has any new shit. And uh, these guys did get their shipping notifications for live too. I did not get mine. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm extremely depressed or I would be had my Des Moines CD not finally shown up from you music. So thank you, you music and my triple vinyl from creatures finally showed up as well after threatening credit card action with having zero shipping movements since the label was generated on the 18th of November. So mm. I had a happy ending today, which is really nice. Also nice is this arrived. And oh, yes, oh, yeah. there's now a picture book about Richie Scarlet, written by a friend of mine, Jean Ramsey, who has put together, it's a pictorial history of Richie. And you either love Richie or you don't. And if you don't, well, just tune out for a second because I do. And I couldn't wait to see the Ace Band with him as a member. So it's really nice to see a you know full color, a uh, glossy photo book paying tribute to Richie's career and dogged determination to make it in the music business and some of the many interesting people and personalities that he's encountered along his crazy journey, one that continues. So uh, congratulations to Richie having a book out about him and to Jean for publishing and editing and putting together a, a wonderful looking piece of work as well. So it does tell a really cool story. So if you're interested in picking that up, go to, let's see, I got to get it right. RichieScarletBook.com. There you go. You can get some flyers, which I'll, uh, I'll paper the wasp show tomorrow night with Richie Scarlet flyers. How about that down at the Regency in San Francisco? And if you're going to the wasp show tomorrow night in San Fran, um, I'll be there. And uh, be nice to say hi or F you, whatever you want to say to me. Whatever. Um, hopefully see some animals in the audience. All right. Today's episode, because creatures of the night won't stop. And this episode is somewhat framed around a comment that Tim made. And that is, of course, Tim Starr. Oh, boy. And I've already alienated Ken. But, uh, <laughs> We will uh, get started with him in a second when he comes back. So anyway, Tim framed the conversation for this week uh, with a comment was the whole conversation about Vinny's approach to playing the Kiss catalog uh, material live is a fascinating one. On one side, Vinny was supposedly on a leash in the studio, but live apparently he just acted on his own accord and unleashed notes at will. Given Paul and Jean's penchant for control, it's plausible that they sanction and encourage Vinny's more modern approach. Um, How could they not? It was their band. In other words, there's no way the new guy was afforded that kind of unrestrained freedom live without the blessing from the bosses. And I thought that was a really good point to make about Vinny's playing when he comes into the band, because the band had been going through a dynamic shift between 19, what, 1980. Well, 1980, when Eric Carr joined, and 82, when they finally get back on the road. So the band had fundamentally changed in that period. Number one, in its sonics, when Eric Carr comes comes in on drums. But I think, and Mark, we were talking a little bit about this beforehand. One of the big things is how being the first person to replace a signature guitarist is a really tough role to play in a band. So why don't you take that for a moment while I say hello to all the animals in the chat? Yeah, well, it it definitely is the more difficult position to be in if, you know, compared to being, let's say the second or third or fourth guitarist in the band replacement. Hopefully you don't, hopefully you're not like the seventh or something. Then people are going to get a little, you know, what the hell is going on here. Uh, But, you know, when you're the first one, you, you get, you get a lot of this in the audience. You know, like people arms crossed, not, you know, prove to me that you're worthy of replacing this guy, you know, uh, and, you know, sometimes you can do absolutely nothing right in these people's eyes. And other times, some sometimes people are more accepting of it and, and, and want to have you do well, because 
if you do well and people accept it, that means that the band will continue on and there'll, there'll be more music from this band for years to come. So there's kind of a, there's always that kind of dynamic I find when you're a new guitar player, you know, sometimes you're going to get the people that have those signs up, you know, you know, saying derogatory things. Like there was that time when I remember hearing about uh, Brad Gillis when he was touring with Ozzy when Randy died and people were holding up Randy rules and, you know, all this stuff and just booing him like crazy. And then after a while, he started winning over the fans and then he ended up leaving the band anyways. But, you know, it, it, it can be difficult to do it. And, you know, I think Vinny uh, didn't have the easiest job to do in, in that sense. Not technically, I think, you know, replacing Ace... You know, he was he didn't do the most complicated solos. He definitely had his own style of playing. That's for damn sure. But for him to have done it note for note probably would have been within his skill range easily. But, you know, did he? We'll get into that now when we start talking about it. Yeah, and Ken, you were there. You were you went to multiple shows on the Creatures Tour. Let's just make sure we remind everyone of that. Um <laughs> but what was your impression of Vinny when he started playing, particularly some of those signature songs? Um, you know, and we're going to do comparison. I've got a whole shitload of multimedia streamed and ready to go tonight for us to compare um, the studio versions with what Vinny was playing live. So what did you think from the audience? Were you? No, I wasn't like that. Uh, I mean, maybe in my head I was like that. <laughs> um, but... Uh... I, I kind of, you know, wanted to see what this guy, news guy, you know, new guy ha has got um, as far as uh, playing ability and, and how he sounds. So, yeah, it it somewhat resembled Ace slightly. I mean, it's, it's very little uh, resemblance to Ace, but there's these little hit these key notes here or there of part of Ace's solo. Uh, just so you know, oh, oh yeah, he hit that note <laughs> this part of the solo may be right but most of it was just you know just going crazy on the guitar uh, for the solo so it, it was okay um i knew it was a new guy i thought well he, maybe he just hasn't you know uh, learned aces solo, solos yet and hasn't gotten it down so it, it was okay you know uh from that standpoint i i gave him a you know, a waiver or whatever. A pass. A pass. Yeah. You survive. You survived the invasion. Well, mm -hmm. Corey E fifty one fifty Lee Tales of a Kiss Geek. Um, who else? Two thousand man. Thank you all for joining us live, and thanks for everyone who's, who's tuned in live. Let's jump into some multimedia. The first clip is going to be the first song of the set. I think I'm going to go in in pretty much in order. I don't have the full set queued up. I think I got as far as Love Gun, um, but that's more than enough multimedia. There's about twenty minutes of video or uh, audio clips um, that we're going to play. So let's get started. The first one is going to be Creatures of the Night. <laughs> All right, so that's the studio version, obviously, of the, the title track played by Steve Ferris. Second yes. take, if you've got about the Creatures of the Box Set, uh, Creatures of the Night Box Set, all the details about that solo and how Steve came into the sessions to play that are in there. Um, what, what I want to draw everyone's attention to before I play Vinny's take on that is Vinny's going to get double the space. You know, Steve had to cut his solo in eight measures. Vinny gets 16 during the live performance. So let's uh, go into Vinny's live. This is going to be from, well, you'll see it on the screen. I think it's Rockford.
All right. So that that's Vinny. I gotta I gotta say, whenever Vinny's solos come on for the songs off Creatures, I'm like, wow. When I'm sitting there listening to that one today, just I mean, getting double the amount of time in a song to solo, he does all the same sorts of tricks. Mark, guitarist, differentiate playing in the studio um, versus playing live, particularly well, from the perspective of a solo. Well, I mean, when you're in a studio, you can you know go back didn't like that let me go fix that you know i know that steve harris didn't have you know hours and hours of time to do it I, apparently he did it in a couple of takes second, and, yeah, that's yeah. The second take yeah 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 so and that goes to show you how number one a he might, might must have been prepared or number two how good he is at doing something on the fly like that a lot of these session guys can do this stuff like one two takes no problem uh i love the studio version i always thought that the studio version has all the right elements in there good feel good tonality good pitch you know it, it definitely feels like it was meant to be in that song uh vinnie live look at when you're playing live you're pl flying by the seat of your pants you know you can't go back and oh sorry guys can we stop and go back two bars uh, i want to do that better you know you can't do that so what you play is what you play and uh, you know a lot of it was was pretty decent you know uh there are a few bends in there that were a bit questionable to my ear a couple of like suspect notes but again it's live you know and he, he uses a lot of the whammy bar there that was his big thing uh with this too that, that he, he was a he was a whammy bar guy but this was a new thing for kiss fans because ace never even touched a whammy bar until into his freely's comet time so uh yeah he, it's it's not a bad solo i mean again uh i think that they wanted to modernize you know, their overall sound a bit. And he did a good job in this one. Plus, it, it is a new song, too. So I think that he gets a little bit more leeway with doing newer things in there, too, even if it isn't note for note from the studio. No, but I think it stays very honest in terms of representing an expanded version of the studio solo, which is very concise and edited and fits in perfectly for what you'd expect on an album. Um, Ken? Yeah, I mean, it, it's... At the beginning, it somewhat resembles uh, Steve Ferris's uh, at parts, little parts here and there, but it's pretty much uh, Vinny's own solo uh, on the song. And you know, it for what it is, and it being live, it works. You know, it worked in the song. Um, I guess if I heard it a million times, like I've heard Creatures, I, I would feel like you know, you get used to it, and you you understand, you know. Uh, remember the solo and that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, it worked fine on this one. Um, I don't think he really attempted to do Steve's version of it so much. Uh, just a little bit of here and there. Uh, the rest is all Vinny. So it's, it, it worked out. It's work. It works perfectly, perfectly fine. Yeah, he's not he's not exactly machine gunning the notes either. It's still pretty yeah. melodic. And and that's yeah. part of the playing style that I do love about Vinny. I'll always sing his praises, especially on All Systems Go, which is you know, melodic rock that's very finely crafted, in my opinion. But uh again, Vinny's not a big fan of that. Let's move on into Strutter. And the first song, uh, the first uh, clip's going to be from Auckland, which is, of course, uh, Ace's final live performance with the band um, in a public concert, obviously, mm -hmm. until 96. Um, and then there's a couple of other clips. So here we go. <laughs> All right, so all your signature Ace Frehley licks in there. Obviously, Strutter is one of the holy trinity of, you know, well, first three Kiss songs. Just imagine being a fly on the wall the first time Ace laid down a lead on that song in 19, late 1972, early 73, yeah. 50 years ago. Uh, but it's all there. That's all muscle memory in 1980. He could have been wrecked and uh, <laughs> still play that solo. Let's mm -hmm. go into, this is El Paso. So later on in the Creatures tour for Vinny's take on it. <laughs> All right, 
right. So that was uh, breaking up a little bit. I don't know whether that's my bandwidth or what. So um, let's uh, just move one step forward and listen to Bruce's take from 84. Okay. <laughs> All right, so that's three takes of Strutter and the solo. I think, you know, again, Bruce clearly has the benefit of not being the first guy and being able to fine tune also how Kiss had evolved by 84 by the time he's in the band and Vinny doesn't. But my take on Vinny is that he's very much staying to Ace's framework, but putting his own stamp on it. Ken? Yeah, I mean, he put a little bit of his own stamp on it. Um still it didn't really replicate uh obviously uh aces solo and actually it probably barely does in my in my opinion because you get so used to a solo um mm. and and to tell you the truth i think and we need to play bruce's also i think bruce's sounded better than than vinnie's uh it sounded more you know, I, w I want to say organized. I, I don't know if that's the right word, but uh, it, it just, to me, made more sense than Vinny's version. Um, even though Bruce is maybe following Vinny's version a bit, um, I think it's actually better and an improvement. You know, because of the whammy? <laughs> yeah, it's like that whammy. Yeah, because, I, I mean, Mark, tell me if I'm wrong by what you hear. I hear Vinny sticking more to bends and vibrato than relying on the wang bar. Yeah, yeah. And and this in this solo particularly, I think that he does do a lot more of the bending. He he loved his bends. Like, that's one thing that Vinny was notorious for. He liked doing these, like, big bends, over bends and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, this, he, he definitely showed it in this song. Uh Again, listening to, to Vinny is difficult, I find, sometimes for the same reason that I think Ken brought up because you're so used to a certain way to hear a solo. And then when he comes in and does something completely different and even you know throws in notes that Ace would never do in a solo, then you're kind of like, mm, you know, you don't know how to feel about it at that time, right? I mean, if, if you never heard Ace's solo and this is the first time you heard the song, then maybe you would think, okay, whatever, you know, you might give, have a different opinion of the solo. It's not terrible by any stretch of the imagination. Obviously, look, if he was that bad a soloist, they wouldn't have took him, you know, end of story, right? Mm -hmm. So he, I think that he does a decent job. I mean, even Ace solo that we just heard, that wasn't pretty much the same as studio. He did a little bit of modifications to it as well, but there was enough of it in there for people to, you know, identify it and say, yeah, I, I know what's going on here, right? Uh, and Bruce, I've always thought that Bruce took the best of what ace did and kept those parts in there and just added in his parts and i thought that the parts that he added in with it just made sometimes these solos just a teeny bit better i know ace people are going to hate me for saying that but uh, i i think sometimes he, he improved on some of ace's solos with his styling yeah, he modernized them, but also, again, at the time we're becoming fans, you and I in particular, I think his playing certainly fit more into that wheelhouse of player. And maybe, I don't know, I, I think I'm more comfortable with it because that was generally the first versions of the solos I heard. Mm -hmm. You know, Animalized Live Uncensored comes to mind. Um, one thing I do want to mention is that Bruce was given a tape of Vinny to learn the the kiss stuff from and he didn't think that vinnie's interpretations were and this is from guitar or rolling stone interview mm. pardon me um didn't think that vinnie's interpretations were to his liking okay. which you know come on <laughs> a, a, as a guitarist you're always going to think that the other guy is getting it wrong generally mm. uh, especially when you've got the chops to back it up with and i think that's where he comes from especially on the classic songs that he listens to how vinnie's interpreting it and then also respects how Ace played it, and I think he's middle ground. 
which is hardly surprising with it being Bruce. Come on, like the most reasonable, nice guy in the world. Of course, he's mm. going to be middle of, of, of the ground. All right, let's move on into Calling Dr. Love. This is an, obviously another classic, a classic mm. Binky solo. Let's be clear there. Uh, because Aces wasn't exactly original, it was inspired by Binky. So here we go. Christ, make it stop. Make it stop. Wow. Uh, that, one, that, one, that one's pretty brutal, actually. Uh, Ken. Yeah, you know, um, <laughs> I mean, it's such a classic A solo, you know. Um, and I love, uh, you know. Of course, Is the butcher version. in the meat market on this one, though? Um, it's just, I mean, there's 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 little points here and there that obviously follow it and you can you kind of you know resemble it it's a there's a resemblance there at least it's not totally you know gone because it's such a classic solo on on that song um and one thing comes to mind when i think about this you know when you uh you're so used to hearing a solo or a song or, or whatever a certain way and even a singer and a singer sings something different that like hits a note that why didn't you go to that high note that you always do? But they, you know, as, and it's like, what, what are you doing? You're you're, you're messing with the <laughs> how it's supposed to go. But it's it's kind of like that. Um, just one note, almost, or even multiple notes being different, can really screw things up and not feel right. But um, again, we're so used to, or I was so used to calling Doctor Love solo. That at least Aces was resembled his own, uh, obviously, but yeah, Vinny's is kind of uh, it's it's just little little parts here and there. He's got it, but you know, I guess he made it his own, and it kind of went went off the board a little bit there. I don't know. Took a left turn at Albuquerque, uh, Mark. <laughs> Well, yeah, I actually, think... we're seeing comments, a long fart, buzzsaw. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this one is painful to listen to. I mean, the the, the, <laughs> the fact is, Calling Dr. Love is probably one of Ace's most uh, recognizable and probably one of his best solos. I remember in yeah. many different uh, guitar solo rankings, people would rate this one as probably one of Ace's best guitar solos he's done, period. And... <laughs> I, I agree. I think it's a great guitar solo. When I hear Vinny do this, it's like, wow. Like, even on, and, and the funny thing is, you would think that, okay, maybe that was just that night he played it that bad. No, because I mean, when you watch the real performance of him doing this song, wow. The, 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 that ending that we were just like plugging our ears to, he does the exact same thing. Those, those unbelievably high notes with the whammy bar at the end which is still not anywhere near the proper intonation that it should be when he's doing that. It, it's just, I don't know what he was thinking on that. I just think that he just tried to go for broke and tried to make it over, over the top. And I think, honestly, mm -hmm. I, I think that he should have just stuck with more of Ace's actual framework, like actual notation of it, and maybe do a thing here and there. He, he Like, I mean, I, can't, I keep saying this, Bruce is the king of that. He'll take what's good about his solo, keep as much of it as as he thinks is good about it in it, and then modify here and there. And that's what always made his solos great. And Vinny has no clue how to do that, especially in this song. It's just absolutely terrible. Yeah, but think of the pressure that he's under heading into a band like Kiss. He's basically going from being a nobody 
to playing in front of 2,000 people and ordering pizza. Um, okay. No. Okay, but he, one but thing he, I got to say. Known that. But one thing I got to say, <laughs> that they were clearly making board tapes of these of these shows. Were they? Well, obviously, if, they, if we had them. Uh, and, and what I'm trying to say is that I'm pretty sure Paul and Gene must have heard this. You don't think that maybe one of them would have came over and said, hey, dude, what's going on here with this solo? You know, I mean, sure. Maybe he would have been one of those guys that said, hey, fuck you. I'm doing whatever I want, you know. Who knows? But I'm I'm surprised they didn't bring it up because, like I said, this this solo is not just to happen on this night. He's done this kind of a solo numerous nights. Yeah. So um, practicing guitar. Thanks for joining us. This is, of course, your your topic uh, that I've adapted to be our discussion point to frame. You know, playing some of these things because I think it's great to differentiate between the studio, the pre the originator and also the, the new guy but you also bring up an additional point um you know which is how solos i guess do evolve anyway so uh, is mm. anyone a butcher I, there's a lot of butchering that's gone on in the kiss catalog live particularly so let's move on to the next song i'm gonna we're gonna call out the firehouse <laughs> actually almost see ace in your head when yeah. he's bringing oh, yeah. back on those notes i, I mean <laughs> come on it, it's ace it's a signature solo again i it, it's like that's my comment for nearly every ace song on this discussion but let's listen to vinny's take <laughs> Now he's he, he can't quite ring out those notes, but I, I want to make one comment about Vinny, uh, particularly on here. I, I hear a different cook preparing the same recipe. Um, there's it's just two different approaches to playing the same kind of structure throughout, and that's just to me. And again, this is very subjective, everyone's going to have their taste of things that they like, things that they don't, and it's perfectly fine. Um, but I also want to kind of back that up a bit and say, This is Rockford. This is two shows into the tour. And while he may have been rehearsing all of these solos from September onwards, when he signed up to be the touring guitarist, being live, moving on stage and performing for the audience, whether it's 2000 or 3000 is irrelevant, uh, does change from being in a hangar in Dallas. Mark. Yeah. I mean, those are all valid points, obviously. Uh, but but. I, I still... But I still think that regardless, uh, he, he, God, he really butchers this one. I mean, this one is one of those songs where Ace, Ace gave him the, gave him the benefit of, of a relatively easy solo. It's a lot of the same note. It's, it's all pentatonic in that box. That whole solo is just A. Okay. And, and how, many bad notes he put in that i just can't believe it i mean the david's comment is absolutely perfect spot on perfect except for timing yeah yeah timing uh tuning and performance great 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 point 
it's it, it's just sometimes he grabs that whammy bar too much and just goes too nuts with it. Just he need he does he doesn't put in enough of the the, the, the original solo. And that bothers me really, because sure you want to show that you know you're not ace that you're a, you're a better guitar player or whatever, but you have to make the song you know m memorable or identifiable to the audience for crying out loud. I mean they're, they're gonna you come to this part and people are gonna start listening to him. What what the hell song is he playing? You know like it, it sometimes sounds like they uh, like I don't know what whether he's trying to play this song or a different song. That's how different it sounds to me. Again, I mean, right, I, but I, you, you not think <clears throat> that Paul Stanley and Gene Simmons didn't hear him in rehearsals, or do you think that he played Ace's solos note for note in rehearsals, and then when it came to live, uh, <clears throat> flipped the switch and went in? Yeah, no, you, uh, I, no, I wouldn't be surprised, but you know, look, I think the what there's one important thing that we're probably missing out as well is that they Gene Simmons has said a hundred times now whether Gene is being 100% honest or not, we don't know. But he said that basically they came to a point where they had to go on tour and they needed a guitar player and they were kind of forced to take Vinny. So even if they heard him in the rehearsals and they were, and they were, they were doing that. He signed the contract in September 82. They didn't go on the road until the end of December. The tour well, would, have, would have been booked mid-year. So they wouldn't okay. be going on the road. But they were still they were still auditioning. Well then, I'm gonna I'm gonna After say this the then. Of the album. Okay, so if that's the case, then I think Paul and G need to get their hearing checked because if that's what he was playing at the rehearsals and they thought that that was passable, they were wearing wow. earplugs. Yeah, but <laughs> something is wrong with their hearing. Ken, does that firehouse solo cause you anger? It doesn't cause me anger, but it's, <laughs> you know. <laughs> This is Ace, or not Ace, but uh, Vinny, when he first got the job and he's going to practice the solos and he's like, okay, I'm going to practice all these Ace solos. I'm going to do them. Okay. Da, da, da. It's like, okay. And then a month later, it's like, uh, nah, I don't want to do all those. I'm just going to do my own little thing here and, and go crazy. Um, I, I, I just don't think he really wanted to play aces solos note for note and he just wanted to do his own thing i think in some cases he, he could have interchanged the same solo with multiple songs even <laughs> it's possible so i you know i i just i i don't know he he didn't want to follow aces he he'll start maybe with a note of aces stuff and then end the solo with the, some notes at the end but in the middle it's like you know gloves are off or whatever you want to call it <laughs> yeah and this is another good point um listen to the rio 83 version of firehouse again totally different ball game and yeah that is the point i want to continue stressing this is early on in the tour if i had more time than what i like to uh, a lot for doing these shows then i would be queuing up lick it up audio as well as particularly from the tail end of that tour to compare where Vinny had gone with the sound and some of what are spectacularly glorious performances we've already mentioned rio a couple of times within a couple of different contexts so uh, again judging an early performance from early on in the tour compared with aces is just a starting point of the conversation um because again i'm, I'm only stylistically comparing intent not necessarily with execution from early on and and i do have one later on in this discussion where you'll hear what he does early on in the tour and later on in the tour for that but it's just i, I had two days to prepare for this um and that's simply not enough so let's get into a solo that i can actually play and it is seven notes <laughs> i wish I, I wish vinnie had played it at the hangar um but I love it loud. And we'll start with the notes. studio version, which is so simple. As I said, even I can play it. Mm -hmm. It must have been torture for Vinny to have to play only seven notes. And live. Turn it up! Turn it up! All right. 
a little bit of gratuitous whammy coming into the live version, but wow. I, to think seven notes and it's bends. So, such a simple solo. Uh, Mark. Wow, I can't believe it. He played it the same way as it was in the studio, pretty much, for the exception of one little part there. But look, he's technically a great guitar player. He can do this stuff. You know, we know, we all know that. But man, I mean, what? I just wonder what he th what he's thinking in his own head. Why? Why he thinks that some of this insane changing of so songs that, like the solos that he does. Why he thinks it's that it sounds good, I don't know. But this this one is was, this is a great example. He did a great example here of showing that he can play it really well. He he added a real good feel to it. I, I think that there's nothing there's nothing bad to say about this solo. I think he did a great job on that. Ken, yeah, it's perfectly fine. I mean, yeah, he he matched the solo. Uh, it was it's a simple solo. We well, played the solo in the studio. Like you yeah. said, seven. Oh, there you go, seven notes. Um, and I'm sure it's fine. I mean, if you, if you wanted to compare his Lick It Up own solos from Lick It Up and you know uh, the Lick It Up album and playing those on tour, I'm sure those are you know pretty similar and 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 well done. Um, though I think he used to go crazy on his own sometimes. But uh, yeah, I mean, how can you mess this one up? I mean. Mm -hmm. I I couldn't mess it up. I think Ken could play it, no problem. <laughs> I could play it. <laughs> Put it on your little kiss. On my guitar, little toy guitar. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, there you go. Oh, um, do you remember Carrie King playing the My Little Pony guitar? Or was it Dave, <laughs> Dave Grohl bashing yeah. away on the, the, the drums? Those are cool. All right. So Vinny totally stays. Well, he honors himself with that yes. solo. All right. So Cold Gin, we're going back to another, obviously. Classic. You know, classic song, typical Ace in terms of the soloing. Um, and let's hear Vinny's take from Rockford. Let's see, I've got the right one queued up. Nope, wrong one. <laughs> All right, so uh, just a quick explanation on that. Rockford, Vinny gets more space because of the outro. Um, on the Auckland Ace Fraley recording, it segues uh, directly into Strutter, so Ace doesn't mm. get to do that second solo. But you know what? I think typical Vinny there. Um, it, it's definitely, a, again, similar recipe, different cook. Mark. Yeah, actually, I didn't mind that one too much. Uh, you know, basically just playing over an A sort of riff. You, you can't really screw that one too badly, I don't think. But it, and you know, there was nothing there that made me kind of cringe. I mean, you could have saw obviously on some of the clips that we listened to before. I did a couple of really like whoa, like painful looks on the face when he was playing. But none of those were present on on this solo. I think he did a pretty decent job on the on the outro of this one. I, again, when he when he thinks about, well, I think when he's more settled in and he's locked into the groove, he can play some pretty good solos on here. And I think this is one of the better ones that we've heard so far. Yeah, it, it's tough. I mean, there's there's quite a few people in the chat uh, who've been contributing who are guitarist. Gene obviously <laughs> has uh, definitely played guitar, knows his way around it more more so than I can ever, you know, begin to explain, you know, just what I hear versus what I do on my little Jackson soloist behind me. So Ken, Cold Gin, you know, original, you know, early Kiss song that Vinny's updated. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, it worked okay. Uh, I was fine with it. It's you know a little different, of course, and but uh, it's more. It makes more sense this time. It doesn't sound like he's just uh, making it up as he's as he's going along. This one actually uh, fit the song better uh, and you know closer to what Ace maybe would have done. Yeah. So 
Cecil or Cecil, whichever way you prefer. Uh, Vinny's playing on the treasure record is really good. Oh my God. Those are some really tasty solos. And you remind me of another point I wanted to, to make. Has anyone ever heard a soundboard of Vinny playing with Carmine in the rockers? Mm -mm. I would love to hear what he was doing. 1980, 81. Um, you know, we've heard some of the stuff that he was writing earlier on, but I would like to hear some Vinny live earlier on in his career. And it's just not out there. Whereas with Eric Carr, we can go through creation, salt and pepper, flasher, Solomon. I mean, there's mm -hmm. an, an, there's an abundance, but with Vinny, there is not an awful lot of it. So, um, Let's jump into the next song, which you already know what it is, if you've been paying attention since I jumped the gun on it. It is, of course, Keep Me Coming. Uh, the studio version is supposedly Vinny. And um, again, like several of the songs on the album, there on the studio versions, there's only eight measures of space for the solo. And this is, of course, Sioux City, where Vinny again gets double the space. <laughs> anyone says i actually love that live take on that solo it mm. is so vinny so much in his character and in a, a lot of what he brought as a guitarist to the band and i i'm on the fence you know of whether that's him in the studio but just that ending phrasing on the studio cut yeah it's vinny um ken yeah, it's got to be uh, Vinny, uh, Vinny in the studio because it's because he kept. <laughs> this is the uh, closest, other than uh, "I Love It Loud," that he's you know kept the solo to. Um, I think he's just you know used a multiplier and doubled his notes for <laughs> for most of it. It's like the twice twice amount of the notes he played in the, the solo on the record that he and he played uh, he played live so. Uh, but so it, it made sense. It fit, and it sounds like a lot like the, you know, it's familiar. So it sounds like the solo that was on the album. Okay, that song is embarrassing, hated, <laughs> Mark. <laughs> uh, actually, I thought that this was done very, very well. Um, like the studio version, obviously, we're so used to it. And like I said before, you can you can go in the studio and do it until you get it the way you want it. So it's always going to sound decent, I sure. think. Uh, live, I think he did a great job with this one. I mean, I was actually kind of surprised there. I was, you know, find myself closing my eyes, getting into it and listening to it. He played it really well. I, I think that he he must really like that solo, I think, because he really recreated it really well. It sounds really good. I mean, there, there's no, you know, skunk notes in it. There's no crazy, you know, recreation of something that wasn't supposed to be there. I think that he did a great job on that song. And Sioux City is pretty early in the tour. Am I not correct on that? Show number two. Yeah. So there you go. Yeah. So that goes to show you that he 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 can, he can be obviously fully prepared and ready to play something very well. There was a great example of it right there. Yeah. I mean, one would it'd be nice if the first show exists and leaves. Yeah. It, that that would really be the one that you know I'd want to hear now. Someone asked early if this was uh, any of this audio. You know, go listen to the box set. You, you can get most of it out there, and it's all out there anyway now. But this is all pre any of that rubbish. Um, let's go into War Machine again. It's going to be Vinny in the studio versus Vinny live. And my notes here 
say that War Machine is my favorite solo by Vinny on the Creatures album. That gives me a lot of wiggle room for the songs I do. I agree with that. Well, let's see. Let's see what we think. pause it for a second there before we, we let him continue with the live version what i like so much about the studio solo is that it tells a mini story musically and that to me is a sign of a very good solo it's got like a beginning it's got a middle it's got a plot that brings you to you know the crescendo and dive bomb at the end that leads back in um you know to the vocal so yeah. let's see yeah. what he let's see what he does live Now we're not going to get listen to it again. But I, <laughs> Tales of a Kiss Geek, you're killing me. That solo is horrible. I love it on a technical level because it's like Vinny Live is saying, you remember how you wouldn't let me play those five notes in the studio? Well, here they are. Those five notes are back now. Mark, let's start with you on, on both of those. Well, I, I love War Machine. It's a great song. Uh and again, so used to the so studio version of that solo, uh, and it's a good solo. Again, I, I agree with with you, Julian, about how it's well structured. You know, the beginning, the middle, and end to it. It definitely sounds well constructed and thought out. Uh, live, it wasn't too bad. There was just when he came in there, it was a little like whoa, like a little you know, little crazy with the with the bend there at the top there. But other than that, it wasn't too bad. He he did a couple of you know extra like that. That's one thing I noticed about. Vinny live, he likes his multiple. He does like a lot of those multiple notes things there. Yeah. Uh, that's very, very uh, Vinny. And, and he does a lot of those like, dan, 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 like those really high. He'll bend the note up, like hold the note, play the note, and then drop down from the note, which is different than going up, playing a note and then bending up to it. He does it kind of like backwards sometimes, which is interesting and works well if you can do it well, like Vinny Moore and these guys do. Uh, but it, it's it's not a bad solo, uh, and it, it, it compared to some of the other solos that I'm sure we'll hear, this one sounds very masterfully done compared to some of the ones that will come later. But th this it's not bad. I mean, like, again, I think we Julian made a great point that the solos that he plays on the record tend to sound better live than the ones that he doesn't play, like like Ace solos. So. Yeah, those are the ones, you know, kind of where I really felt that Tim's comment, you know, resonated that in the studio, you can see Paul standing over him saying, no, make it more simple, you know, do this, do that, um, that he's really being gui guided mm. or restrained, depends on your perspective, more that Paul knows or thinks he knows what he hears in his head for a song. And Vinny is, you know, simply to execute that live he's able to put more of his personality back into it. And it really came through on a, on a solo like that. Ken. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's hard to, to me, it's hard to butcher your, your own solo. <laughs> and I you can know, do so, it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure it's been done before, but um, yeah. Like Mark said uh, at the beginning of it, it's kind of came in rough at the beginning of that solo, but then it kind of smoothed out and, 
things felt more structured and more, you know, you know, like the uh, album or studio version of it. Um, so it was, it was recognizable, at least. Uh, unlike, you know, where when he's playing somebody else's solo, like Ace, then it's it's hard to recognize it. <laughs> it really, yeah. it's very hard to recognize when he does Ace's solos versus his own solos. Yeah. I want to thank everyone again for joining us today. You know, while we've been doing live episodes, this is like a little bit of experimentation to see if I can still multitask enough to queue up multimedia and talk about it while doing a show. Um, I'm on the fence as to whether I'm being successful. So in your comments um, after the show, don't tell me that I'm suck while I'm in the middle of doing, trying to do this. Um, <laughs> let, let us know if you like this sort of uh, show format. Um, let's move on into Shout It Out Loud, one of my mm. all-time favorite Kiss songs and from mm -hmm. Mark's all-time favorite Kiss album. Oh, yeah. And again, yeah, Auckland. <laughs> and, and my notes again on this was, uh, oh, I'm going to say it again, signature A solo. And I'm like, no, wait, signature Bob Ezrin solo sung to Ace and played on the piano for him to imitate. Um, mm. Let's yeah, shut up and play the music. <laughs> I was enjoying it. All right, so that one's probably the most honest uh, in terms of imitating what Ace did, but also the tone is different because clearly uh, different guitars, different everything um, down to the fingers and brain. Mark. Yeah. That, that was surprisingly pretty similar to aces. Uh, you know, missed a note or two here, but again, you brought up an interest, a good point about that, Julian, that, you know, you don't forget this guy's also on stage and moving around and posing and doing stuff like that. So it's possible to miss a note here and there. Uh, but overall it wasn't bad. You know, it wasn't bad. I mean, I'm not, I know everyone's saying horrible tone and terrible. That's not, I'm not talking about tone. I'm just talking about his performance. His guitar tone, his solo tone is definitely something I would never use personally myself. But, you know, I, I'm, I'm, from a performance point of view, he, it was surprisingly close to, to Aces. And, and I think that it, it, be, it benefited from him doing that because uh, could you imagine him trying to do some big like, to kind of solo over that and be like what is he doing you know so yeah good for him that he kept it to aces yeah he, he was starting in some quadruplets uh, here and there on some of the other ones all right uh you know you ain't learning nothing from me austin so let's talk to the voice of reason yeah <laughs> you're right uh, um yeah like mark said i mean it he didn't go off the board uh, you know out, outside the line so much uh he, he kept within the structure of that the original a solo um so again recognizable did a perfectly fine job on it it worked for the live you know performance and uh sounded okay i know there's there's the tone thing but uh otherwise it, you know it fit the song sounded uh familiar as it should <laughs> it should always sound familiar Lee, who is representing the new era of Kiss fans? I know. What's this well, Lee talking about? These yeah, guys. Yeah, Mark and me, we're Asylum fans. That's what we no got kidding. on board. No, um, Lee, uh, and I guess also Tales of Kiss Geek, uh, when did you guys get on board? Uh, throw it in the comments while I queue up the next uh, audio because we, we're the Kiss FAQ. We want to re represent all facets we talk about a lot of the new stuff i don't know what episodes you've been watching but yeah well i well new opinions maybe new faces and we're always keen well everybody has it. everybody has their own opinion that's because it's not your opinion doesn't mean it's not right right so uh, expand on that Ex as steven tyler would say express yourself all <laughs> yeah. right rock and roll hell which um robin ford oh, plays yeah. the solo on the studio mm. version and then we get into uh me trying to load new audio because for the last few songs so here we go <laughs>
Yeah. So on the one hand, you've got Robin Ford. Um, <laughs> what was the Yellow Jackets? Yeah, Jazz, I believe so. Session, yeah, session player <laughs> monster who comes in and because he's a musician, can play any style, whatever's needed. Dial a buffet in terms of being a player and one hell of a player. You, I mean, check out that Yellow Jackets debut album, uh, number one. <laughs> just fantastic and then you've got Vinny putting his spin on it and again i actually enjoy that solo but i really love that song and i've really gotten a kick out of the three you know takes that are on the creatures box set um so i am biased but i think Vinny does a fine job of that again putting his personality and character on it to the point where it was never performed again after rockford so uh mark yeah, uh, the, the studio version is great. I, I love that. Uh, I think Robin did a great job on that. Uh, the the live one was pretty good. I mean, he he, he did kind of he did I'm kind sorry. of uh, yeah he did kind of different. keep with the structure of it there. Uh, what I did find interesting though is when they did that second part, and clearly I think that's Paul and him trading off licks back and forth there because it wasn't just him playing that because there was overlap of the leads there going on. So I think Vinny was playing something, then Paul played a little something, then Vinny played something. Uh, not a bad idea. They should be, maybe should have worked on it a little bit more and kept it in the set. Maybe maybe that's why maybe that's why they tossed it from the set. They said, that's not working. You know, we, we shouldn't do that again. And that's that. But overall, I think Vinny did a pretty decent job on this one. Again, this is, it's surprising that he didn't, butcher this one as much either i mean he, it's it's the new album but clearly he didn't play it on this in the studio that one so but he did a good job all right Corey, thank you for explaining who tales of a kiss geek is glenn yeah come on over to the kiss faq board and if if you're a member on there uh send me a pm and who knows maybe we can have a topic that includes you as part of the panel ken what's your take on rock and roll yeah um like i said the original obviously is great by robin robin um Vinny, it, it barely resembles that <laughs> solo. He kind of created his own new solo, I think, for it, uh, which actually wasn't a crazy and wild solo. It was it actually fit the song um, a bit, you know, and, and it sounded okay. So it, it works. Again, I'd rather hear what I am used to <laughs> from the album, but uh, it, it's not a, you know, a, butchering kind of job that uh, he may have done on a couple other things. Yeah. So what I meant to do, and I didn't, again, I'm, I apologize for the, the, my, my time limitations, this uh, limitations this week. Um, I wanted to put Ace's origins recording of rock and roll hell on there because <laughs> I was, I was, oh. well, I was really chuffed when Ace did that yeah. because I thought, wow, I mean, what if Ace had, and how fun that he did hmm. um and i can't even remember what he did as a solo so that really says how successful that experimentation was so let's move on <laughs> um last point on rock and roll hell is again like 
so many of the other solos from Creatures on the studio album, they're eight measures, and Vinny's given mm -hmm. 16 live, so he gets double the space to breathe and to really develop more character of the song. And again, it, uh, whether it's space filling or just letting him be Vinny more on stage and establish an identity, I think that's one point that we haven't talked about since we're only comparing studio versions on the albums and aces, you know, final um, live versions. These early creatures shows, regardless of Vinny's personality flaws as you perceive them, because none of us know the guy, are about him establishing a new character, a new identity, and a new authority. It, he has no legitimacy at this point, and he's wearing Ace Frehley's boots at this stage. <laughs> Literally, he's wearing Ace's right. boots yeah. and playing Ace's solos, and he's having to establish himself as a guitarist in the band. And some of these songs, Keep Me Coming Doesn't Last, um, we'll assume that it was performed at the first show and then Sue, so two performances. Rock and Roll Hell had three. And then it becomes more vanilla that clearly the songs that worked and what they saw from the audience are kept and a couple more classics come back in. Let's go to the final new song from the album, I Still Love You. And again, it's Robin Ford. This solo on the album is absolutely sublime from a uh, guitarist perspective. The emotion yeah. that he wrings out of that neck, note by note. And then we'll hear Vinny's. Um, and I'll pause. All right, so this is the, the one song where I did make time this afternoon to go and get a performance from later on in the tour because, to be perfectly honest, that um, where, where was that one from? That was Rockford, mm. and I, I thought it sucked. Um, so let's uh, jump forward in the tour to El Paso and hear Vinny's take on it there. All right, so Mark, is, is that was that fair to put in that that later performance? Yeah, I think that's much snow. That's much smoother. There's some nice quads thrown in. Little those little phrases, and you mentioned it early. The little uh, that he put at the end of a phrase, um, hmm. just wonderful. Yeah, I, I think that was much better. G great call putting that show in after because that that Rockford one was like whoa. It wasn't horrible, but it wasn't. It was still nowhere near as good as the this El Paso show. Uh, much better. Sounds like he's much more comfortable playing the song and the solo overall. So, yeah, much 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 better. I think that uh, it's a better representation of what he can do live. 
when he's when he's prepared and he knows what he's doing and you know maybe he maybe he got talked to who knows maybe uh, maybe it's just a matter of him just being more comfortable with it and getting the solo better under his fingers and he now realizes what works live and what doesn't work live and you know what would be also a good idea i think this tales of a kiss geek and lee they should why don't you guys start a podcast you know you guys seem to be both very good in uh with the whole kiss thing so rather than you know busting our balls on here about it why don't you guys make a podcast on and about it and see what's going on we'll, we'll, we'll watch it for sure but hey you know. hell yeah more <laughs> more kiss podcast the better all right ken what do you think of i still love you and uh, who was it that said um mtv unplugged for the for the win because yeah mm, yeah the uh yeah it's the two versions at least the rockford and then the later version is it's like <laughs> night and day um I really don't didn't care for that first one at all. It seemed like he didn't. He was kind of making it up and didn't really understand the solo or remember what the solo was supposed to be like uh, for the most part. But the the second one was much better, much better. So much closer to uh, the studio version, and it actually you know sounded you know right on, and it worked perfectly. Um, but yeah, the early one was, he needed, I guess, more practice or like Mark said, maybe Paul had a talk with them and said, Hey, this, this, you got to get this solo, right? You need to fix this or something like that because, uh, the first one wasn't that good, but the, yeah, the later one was really good. Yeah. I, I want to add one thing to that again, Rockford is early on in the tour. Adrenaline is running off, you know? He's been on stage. We're deep into the set now, don't forget. So mm -hmm. that adrenaline, it's still new, playing in front of a, uh, you know, an, a paying audience. So I don't doubt that muscle memory is not there yet because doing that set every night with the adrenaline flowing is uh, completely different. You know, it, it's the same for anyone. If you sit and play guitar for 45 minutes or an hour and a half, you know, if you're playing the same shit, it gets easy. And then if you go and have a break for three months and then come back to the guitar, you know, you're going to be like that, you know, like that Rockford performance. So mm. let's cue up the final song that I've got prepared. <laughs> um, and it's Love Gun, because this is one that uh, I think had to be done. So let me find the file. Here we go. Fuck that one up and that's Auckland twice in a row, but yeah. um, you know, it, it is it is what it is. Love Gun is the one solo though that mm -hmm. the vast majority think that Vinnie Vincent butchered, and I clearly butchered it by doing the audio. Let's go to some of these comments. Uh mm -hmm. yeah, Lee, we know you're just contributing. Don't worry, dude. There's no shade me thrown back at you. Um, the whole fun of this is to get your guys' interaction when we're doing these shows, get your opinions, get your thoughts on what we're talking about. So exactly. Um, you know, thank you. We do appreciate you being here, watching us, and you know. Yeah, well, I wish I'd had the right one queued up because, uh, <laughs> again, I, I did that one last minute and it was supposed to be Auckland first and then, um, you know, what it is. So what is everyone's kind of opinion on this? 
did Vinnie butcher any of those solos or do you think there are enough mitigating factors? And again, I want to do some more of these kind of comparative episodes. I want to compare some of the songs that Vinnie did during the Creatures tour with what he's doing later on during the Lick It Up tour. Because when he knows all that stuff by heart, the Lick It Up tour, the soundboards from that are spectacular. And, you know, obviously I don't want to really talk about, you know, the Lick It Up songs, but I, I get off more on those and listening to how he's really kind of gotten into it that I don't understand where all that friction comes from with, you know, dragging him off stage because all the solos that I've listened to, his solo spots, they don't really grow. <clears throat> Paul would always come back on stage and say, and Vinnie Vincent on guitar. That was yeah. always his shtick for ending the solos. So again, on, on everything we've gone through, there's a couple that he is kind of off framework, but he's sticking to the plot for the very vast majority. And I think that it comes back to the original comment that inspired this episode, which was, do you think that Paul and Gene would have let him get away with any of this on the Creatures tour early on and then for two years? Mark, well, do you? Uh, no, I mean, clear, I, I mean, clearly, he he improved with time in the band. I mean, as you said, that there there are soundboards from Lick It Up that are really good, good shows, and uh, you know, I, I think the only I think the only thing where he shadow stuff. I think the only thing that he kind of gives them a hard time with is the solo section itself where he's by himself. I think that's where he goes a little bit off the rails, but playing within the songs, I think that he, he does, he does well. I, I think, you know, we don't know what happens backstage off stage with these guys. Right. But clearly on stage, I think that he, he improved with time and I think the lick it up tour was a better representation of what he could do. I think. Yeah. Can. Yeah, I mean, got to give him the benefit of the doubt. You know, <laughs> he had to, you know, learn these songs and and get used to the whole, the whole spiel of Kiss and and uh, get his own boots underneath his feet rather than Ace's. <laughs> um, so by looking up, I'm sure it was better. I, I need to listen to something on the soundboard to see how he was at that point on Ace's older songs, but uh, yeah, I I think it's it's okay. He didn't butcher too many. He, he kind of either just went his own way on it, uh, but he, he obviously was able to, you know, mimic or, you know, keep in line with some of the solos. So if he wanted to do it, he could do it. Um, mm -hmm. One other thing is that last thing with Paul, we know why his voice is messed up because all that extra <laughs> stuff he was doing. Um, but anyway. That's, that's because of I still love you and I want you. So, uh, again, thank you to everyone who's chimed in with comments and joined us live today. I want to end this episode with the song that was cut or the solo that was cut from the box set. And it is, of yeah. course, um, the guitar solo to I Want You from Rockford. And, mm -hmm. you know, Mark mentioned on Three Sides episode this week uh, when they reviewed the the box set. <laughs> In essence, that you know, he was a little bit offended or you know annoyed that they had edited that out. Well, you'll be able to judge for yourself why they may have done that. But you know, I think on our review, I mentioned that you know again, Vinny has history with the band that he sued them repeatedly. So the victors write the history, and the box set is a representation of the history. But I think that there's so much Vinny in that box set that editing out the solo is a very minor offense versus honoring, you know, we, we basically get a 10th anniversary tour uh, commemorative out of that. Um, and again, opinions are always going to vary about how that show was constructed. I happen to, to really like it. So, you know, before, before we go, here's eight minutes of Vinnie Vincent guitar solo which would have been part of um i want you and may god have mercy on our souls <laughs>
Get to the point. Yeah. Hasn't even started yet. Yeah. <clears throat> The pyro. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> oh. I need more. Beer. Kind of like when Aunt Patricia asks you at the dinner table how your hemorrhoids are. Um, <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, yeah, I'm just pausing for a moment because I'm going to play the whole damn thing. But if you're still wondering why it was edited out, I mean, really? Yeah. You're still wondering why? <laughs> I I will play. We will do another multimedia episode in the future. I promise you that. I will play you some solos of Vinny from the Lick It Up tour that I think are absolutely spectacular. Again, this is an unfair representation of Vinny in the band as a soloist because this is the second show. Again, context is everything. I'm not going to say that his solos are going to be to everyone's liking as we get further into his career with the band, but his confidence and adrenaline and muscle memory and where he's at in the show do change from the second show on the tour. So let, let's continue. <laughs> <laughs> I hope there was. just tuning into the kiss faq podcast right now do not adjust your headsets it is not a problem of the audio this is really being played <laughs> I'm sorry. 
All right, we're halfway there. <laughs> Next, we're going to do a reaction video to Speedball Jam. Hmm. Say to that. Why did they cut that? <laughs> we, well, All right, stop that. I should have... Silly. <laughs> oh, shoot. oh, Jesus. All right, so uh, why did they cut that? Um, do, do you really need the answer that from hmm. the soundboard, I guess that they had to construct the show? It wasn't a spectacular example or a shining <laughs> example that would have enhanced the listening experience of the set. Even if it is mm -hmm. editing history, sometimes yeah. history should be edited. So, um, again, it's a really unfair kind of way to end the show about whether Vinny is a guitar solo butcher when I think the evidence <laughs> presenting today shows that he stayed within the framework and did a, a pretty decent job on most of the solos to end with that solo, which is not a fine example of him. Um. <laughs> Thank you, David. That's quite, quite colorfully fun. So yes. on, on that note, I want to thank everyone for joining us today uh, for this live episode, Mark. And Ken, I'm sorry for pulling that on you at the last minute after screwing up the audio for, uh, for Love Gun. But we'll do this again in the future about other tours and, you know, compare Bruce with Vinny, compare Bruce with Ace, compare yeah. Tommy. You know, I, I, I think it, Tommy with Ace. Yeah. You know, it, it's it's all fair to kind of bring up the comparisons between the guys who've been part of the band's history. So everyone who's thrown in comments today, Tim, obviously for, you know, setting this conversation with a very good observation. Thank you very much. Um, 
But everyone, thank you for joining us, and we shall see you next time. And Bye. let's see if I can find the fucking video. I could have been his All name, right. the, the butcher instead of the onk or whatever. Thank you for spending time listening to the Kiss FAQ podcast today. All sales are final. There are no refunds. If you'd like, look us up on Facebook or come over to the Kiss FAQ message board and discuss the topic we broadcast today. Don't forget to rate us on iTunes, Spreaker, or wherever you've listened to the show. We hope you'll join us again.